Okay, so I think we technically have five more minutes till Michigan time, but I thought we could just use the five minutes for some announcements. And so welcome to today's roundtable on North Korea, which would not have been possible without the International Institute and the support of the NAM Center for Korean Studies. And I'm Jian, and I will be the moderator for today's roundtable, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the NAM Center for Korean Studies. And so to, before we begin, I wanted to contextualize today's event just a bit by giving you the motivation behind today's event. And it sprung from this idea that we could use North Korea as a unifying theme, but we could go much more beyond just that rabbit hole. And so to that end, we have an amazing cast of panelists today that could all very uh, intellectually talk about North Korea, but they all have that functional um, space where they're all experts on. And so this would be a very, very great um, event. And so a uh, couple announcements. If you could first put your phone on stealth mode, that would be great. And second, if you've noticed the cue cards uh, on your chairs, those are for the questions. Uh, we'll leave about 20 minutes before the end. Uh, so if you have a burning question that you wanted to ask, you can dot them down on the cue card and I will go through them and see uh, which questions might be salient. And um, I'll be giving very uh, short bios of our panelists today before we begin. And Obviously, I won't be able to do justice to all of their great achievements. But first, we'll have Dr. Robert Axelrod, who is the Walgreen Professor for the Study of Human Understanding at Michigan. And he has dual appointments in the pol Political Science Department and the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy. And if you have majored in international relations or political science, you've probably read his work, which has been cited more than about 30,000 times, um, especially his work on evolution of cooperation. And today he'll talk about strategic stability. And then next we have Dr. Inyop Lee, who is an assistant professor of politics and history at Spring Arbor University in Michigan. And um, his current research interests include international relations and politics in East Asia. And he'll be able to talk, uh, he's just finished a book titled Quote, politics in North and South Korea, political development, economy, and foreign relations, which is forthcoming February 2018. And so today he'll be talking about the connection between domestic politics and foreign policy of the North Korean issue. And then third, we'll have Dr. John Park, who is the director of the Korea Working Group and an adjunct lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School. And he's also a faculty affiliate with the project on managing the atom at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs. And he's also worked at Goldman Sachs prior to this, and so he has that um, niche. And today he'll be talking about, um, or his title uh, is North Korea Inc. Examining the Regime's Accumulated Learning and Evading Sanctions. And then we'll have Professor Christina Dagardis, who teaches transnational law, international and US environmental law, and courses about the United Nations and other international organizations. And today she'll be, uh, and she was also an attorney advisor at the US Department of State Office of the Legal Advisor. And in that role, she provided guidance on the negotiation and implementation of UN Security Council sanctions. And so today she'll be talking about North Korea within the context of United Nations and specifically in the context of sanctions. And then lastly, we'll have Dr. Sarah Potsy, who is a professor and graduate program chair in the Department of Nuclear and Radiological Sciences at Michigan. And she also leads the Detection for Nuclear Nonproliferation Group. And she'll be talking about nuclear treaty verification, monitoring North Korea's nuclear program within the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So we'll start with Dr. Axelrod. Thank you. Um, let me start by explaining what I mean by stability. This, one second, it didn't show up here. Um, there, if you imagine the middle thing, which is a wine glass, if you tilt it a little bit, it'll go back where it belongs. Tilt it too much, it'll go far away from where it started. And that's 
what the, most of the Korean situation is, it's somewhat stable. And a complete stability would be like a plate. You move it a little bit, and it'll, it'll come back. Or a pencil, which is if you move it a little bit, it um, definitely will not come back. And the, um, so I'm going to talk about stability in the context of five different issue areas, arms race, kinetic, which means war, uh, regime stability, cyber stability, and nuclear proliferation. So first, arms race stability. So as you know, in the Cold War, we had mutual assured destruction, which meant that the United States and the Soviet Union, for example, could each destroy each other no matter what the other one did. And so you had a secure second strike, and that meant that there was considerable stability. You didn't have to worry if the other side was about to attack you because you knew that you'd be able to ride that out and be able to attack back, and so they're not likely to do it. And so that's mutual assured destruction. But the U.S. policy on North Korea for 20 years or more has been that that's unacceptable. That the United, and not just from President Trump, but before that as well, that we were, it's unacceptable to allow North Korea to have the possibility of destroying or even attacking major cities of the United States. And yet, in my view, there's no acceptable alternative. Missile defense can help, but it's going to be incomplete. You can't rely on current missile defense against more than a few uh, missiles, which pretty soon they'll have many more. A preventive attack is unreliable. They're still likely to have a few nuclear missiles that can go far. Um, sanctions aren't enough for reasons I'll mention in, if, in the future, I mean, if, further down. And North Korea basically has no reason to negotiate away anything. There's nothing that we could offer that would, uh, would uh, uh, be worth their giving up their nuclear capacity to harm the United States. And so, whether we like it or not, we're stuck with mutual assured destruction. It's a kind of stability, but it's not a very pleasant kind of stability. So in the short run, it's unstable in the sense that North Korea is going to continue to develop their intercontinental capacities. Uh, but in the longer run, I think that the nuclear side, the arms race side, is reasonably stable. However, the kinetic or the warfare aspects are different. So there's an interesting history of provocations from the North that had not been met with much response. The North Korea, for example, has uh, assassinated re leaders of South Korea, they've sunk ships, they've bombarded islands and other things, and yet the South Koreans have never allowed this to get out of hand. They've never really destabilized the situation by substantial retaliation. Likewise, the United States has been provoked. For example, in 68, the North Koreans hijacked a, sp a spy ship, had 83 people on board, uh, they took them hostage, and we didn't retaliate. After 11 months, we settled it by apologizing, of course, as soon as they let the sailors out. We declared the apology uh, inoperable. But the point is we didn't retaliate. And so we, the, the, both the United States and South Korea have a history of not escalating prov against provocations, which is something, of course, the North Koreans might expect to continue. And, the, and the currently, in terms of conventional conflict, the, there's substantial stability and the, uh, because North Korea, as you probably know, has the capacity with its artillery and rockets to kill at least 100,000 people in the first day. And that's because they can attack Seoul with huge numbers of artillery and rockets, and it's a, a massive city. And so um, no matter what happens, if, they, if a war starts, they can kill a huge number of people. I mean, for example, Americans lost 50,000 in Vietnam. They could kill twice that many in one day. However. There have been um, a number of things that the North Koreans have done which um, uh, suggest that war might, uh, might be on the horizon. Uh, for example, just um, a couple of months ago, uh, they officially said that they have the right to shoot down American strategic bombers even when they're not inside their borders, not inside the airspace borders. So they say, no, which we, we flew one up their coast out in international waters, and then they declared that they can shoot it down if we ever do that again. Well, are we going to do it again to test them? Or are they, if we do, are they going to say what they, what they claim they might say? It's hard to say. And of course, we have uh, a hard to predict leaders in both countries. And so I would say that in kinetic stability, there's, um, as kinetic area, there's weak stability. It's a very scary situation. You may have seen the New York Times, where various experts said there's between 25 and 50 percent chance of a war. Then there's a question about regime stability. Uh, in my view, um, the North Korean regime is very stable, at least from um, popular uprisings. Uh, for example, they survived a famine that killed a half a million people. 
So their population is not about to rise up um, under difficult circumstances. There conceivably could be a, a division among the elites, but it seems unlikely. Um, but the other part of the regime stability is that China, in my view, won't strangle the North Koreans, and we'll probably hear more about sanctions. But the, my, the basic idea is that China fears uh, North Korean instability if they're squeezed to death. Uh, they're f more than they fear nuclear proliferation. And because of the Chinese priority, they, may, they, have, they continue to do some sanctions, but they'll never take it to the uh, level that is necessary to really threaten the regime's stability. And therefore, we have, uh, at that level, the Chinese restraint provides that kind of stability. And cyber is less important so far, um, but the North Koreans, again, have done quite a lot uh, against South Korean banks, against U.S. Sony Entertainment. The United States and South Korea have, have, done their, have been very active against North Korea in the cyber realm. For example, it appears that we've, for several months at least, disrupted their missile program uh, with, by cyber means. Uh, but so far, they haven't caused major damage or escalation. Now, the United States, China, and Russia all worry that there is a instability in the cyber realm, that, um, that you don't have a, um, a confidence that you can ride out a major cyber attack from one of the major powers, but presumably from, uh, from North Korea. So I think it uh, is unstable at the low level, but beyond the low level, it's probably fairly stable. And then we get to proliferation. And here there's a real danger because the North Korean capacity to attack the United States has spurred debate in both South Korea and Japan that um, maybe they can't rely on the United States anymore. Now, now uh, Germany relied on the United States, West Germany relied on the United States throughout the Cold War, and it was credible that the United States uh, uh, might risk its cities to protect Berlin. But I think that South Korea and Japan uh, aren't so confident that we'd risk our cities to protect Seoul or, or Tokyo. And therefore, if, as that uh, concern grows because of the North Korean capacity growing and because of the ambiguity of American um, role in the world, uh, they might feel that they need to do, rely on their own defenses, including a, a nuclear capacity. Now, of course, for Japan, that would be a huge change. They're, they have a nuclear allergy that's well established, but on the other hand, they have a, a prime minister that's willing to uh, increase the uh, defense capacity, including anti-ballistic missiles, but possibly, if things get worse, nuclear, and certainly South Korea. The United States has twice stopped South Korea from developing a nuclear program, but would we do it again? Not necessarily, especially if they're um, regarded as essential. And what this really is a danger, not only because of proliferation in East Asia, which would be bad enough, but because if, if uh, Japan or South Korea or both um, begin to develop their own nuclear weapons. There are other countries, such as Saudi Arabia, who worries about Iran and Iran itself um, that might feel they need to um, develop their own. And if those go, then Turkey and Egypt would be next. So um, the uh, instability of the proliferation regime in East Asia could have global consequences. So in summary, the, um, from an arms race point of view, it's unstable in the short range because North Korea is going to continue to proceed to develop its capacity to um, have reentry vehicles and long-range ballistic missiles and hydrogen bombs that can attack American cities. Uh, but once they do that, then like China, there's no need to go further. So we, uh, we accepted Mao having nuclear weapons that can hurt the United States. So I think uh, in the longer run, that's going to be the stable version of an arms race. On the other hand, in kinetic, I wrote stable deterrence. That should really have weak stable deterrence. There is a considerable uh, number of scenarios you could make about how uh, unintended or accidental uh, issues can, um, uh, can escalate, even though uh, both sides have a strong incentive not to, um, not to es escalate to serious war because the, from the South Korean American point of view, the casualties would be tremendous. And obviously, from the North Korean point of view, even a conventional war is likely to destroy the regime. On the other hand, short of war, I think the regime is stable, mo mostly due to Chinese restraint. Cyber, it's unstable at a low level, but it's probably stable at a higher level. But the other as but on proliferation, it's weakened stability uh, exists now because of the uh, concern in South Korea and Japan that maybe they can't rely on the United States anymore. Thank you.
Great. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of domestic, uh, domestic political changes in the issue of uh, nuclear negotiation with North Korea. Um, we all know the famous Twitter message uh, from President Trump. Uh, he said, I mean, when uh, uh, Secretary of State Alex Tillerson talked about uh, he was trying to maintain some channel with North Korea to, uh, in the hope to resume negoti I mean, uh, dialogue uh, with North Korea, and President Trump said something interesting. Um, uh, he's wasting his time uh, trying to negotiate with a little rocket man, and uh, being nice to rocket man hasn't worked uh, in 25 years. Why would it work now? Clinton failed, Bush failed, and Obama failed, and I won't fail. So, um, of course, it is not very organized, systemic analysis of 20-something years of negotiation with North Korea, but there is some assumption in his argument uh, that, uh, I mean, any kind of negotiation with North Korea is some kind of appeasement that was not working at all. Uh, I try to argue that this is not necessarily um, true, and there's some uh, limited uh, success uh, in uh, negotiation with North Korea. And it is not necessarily North Korean uh, negotiation with North Korea itself as a source of failure, but the failure to bring some limited diplomatic success into higher level to make uh, negotiation with North Korea irreversible and uh, ex finally achieving the goal, the final goal, which is exchanging denuclearization of North Korea with a uh, peace treaty and uh, diplomatic, I mean, diplomatic normalization between North Korea and the United States. So um, since I have very limited time, uh, I'm, I'm going to actually talk about the conclusion. Uh, after reviewing the negotiation with the United States and North Korea, I couldn't find any evidence, like clear evidence that North Korea is uh, irrational and uh, unpredictable and crazy or undeterrable or something. Actually, the evidence shows that North Korea, North Korean action can be somehow predictable. And a lot of people in the United States are confusing bad leader with mad leader. Like bad leader might not be a mad leader. Like you, you can find all, all kinds of uh, all kinds of reason to criticize North Korea in ethical perspective. Yet something like human rights abuses and three general three generational leadership succession and nuclear development. But uh, North Korea can be like if you are thinking from realist perspective, North Korean action is very consistent to the uh, realistic assumption of nation states are seeking survival through self help. North Korea is almost the best example fitting that kind of description of realist uh, state. Um, so um, the approaches, uh, there are some interesting approaches of conservative uh, thinkers in the United States to solve nu uh, North, North Korean nuclear issues. First, no North Korea is irrational, therefore negotiation with North Korea will not work. At the same time, they have some kinds of or or nothing or maximalist approach to North Korea, requesting some unconditional surrender like CVID under pre President Bush, like complete uh, verifiable irrational, I mean, I mean uh, irreversible uh, denuclearization uh, de of North Korea first as a condition to start uh, negotiation. So it is almost like maximalist approaches, uh, which is very similar to what President Trump is trying to do like asking North Korea to denuclearize itself or improve its human rights conditions or like change first, uh, sounds great from US perspective, but it will not work in achieving any kinds of meaningful uh, I mean, negotiation. It should be bit by bit uh, approaches uh, moving si simultaneously uh, with North Korea. So um, the, uh, the approaches of like stick only and no carrots policy to North Korea, again, it sounds great, but it, there is very little chance of achieving anything uh, against North Korea. Um, so uh, what kinds of options do we have? Uh, like economic sanctions has been there against North Korea almost like for 64 years, right after, uh, in the middle of like a Korean War. And almost like 20 different sanctions were imposed over uh, North Korea. So we will have an uh, expert in sanction issue, but uh, it was successful in isolating North Korea and containing North Korea from doing something bad, but it was not very successful in solving nuclear problem and improving human rights in North Korea. So you can say the same thing. We tried actually sanctions against North Korea for 60 something years and it was not successful in denuclearizing North Korea. Um, how about uh, wars? Uh, war is not acceptable and actually we have like 
thirty thousand. I mean, uh, thirty thousand actually uh, U.S. soldiers stationed in uh, the United States, and actually two hundred thousand American citizens staying in uh, South South Korea, and one million Chinese are living in South Korea. And some people actually predicted that probably one million people will be dying within twenty four hours uh, if we start the war. The problem is the stakes are too high. Uh, Nobody can dare to start uh, another second Korean war uh, in uh, the Korean Peninsula. Actually, three million people were killed with conventional weapon in the Korean war. So war is not acceptable, and uh, China option, like uh, imp influencing, pressuring China to uh, isolate North Korea or desert North Korea so that North Korea will surrender, which is, again, uh, relatively unrealistic. Um, almost like 900,000 Chinese soldiers were killed in the middle of Korean war, and uh, chi uh, so China already paid huge price in maintaining North Korea there. And China has its own uh, agenda, maintaining North Korea is, uh, as its buffer zone. And China doesn't want North Korea uh, uh, starting uh, nuclear uh, spread into East Asia, into South Korea, Japan, or even Taiwan. But China doesn't want uh, North Korea to collapse down and absorb by South Korea. And actually, US forces, like expand into the north and having some situation like eyeball to eyeball with our Chinese soldiers in the border between China and Korea. So that is not acceptable either. And final option is actually diplomacy, right? But again, the maximalist, um, like uh, all or nothing kinds of approach to North Korea, putting all kinds of precondition and asking North Korea to change first, again, sounds great, but it will not be working. So. Uh, like I'll try to uh, provide some uh, evidence of like diplomacy working and achieving some limited success. Right. So we have a first crisis in 1994, but we have you have to think about like what was happening in 1991. <laughs> that was the moment of uh, uh, Cold War ending uh, in the Korean Peninsula, and actually North Korea was actively seeking negotiation with the United States. At that moment, there was some limited engagement and negotiation with North Korea under senior Bush administration. But actually, it was not successful because uh, it, you, in the United States, it, there was some division uh, in their opinion regarding how to approach North Korea, especially hawks, conservatives, were thinking that there is no, no point actually giving North Korea any kinds of incentive because like uh, most of Eastern European countries and Soviet Union itself, they predicted North Korea will be collapsing down very soon. So what is the point of negotiating with uh, the country which will be collapsing down very soon? Of course, it became some kinds of the story like uh, a boy cried wolf. Many people actually repeated th repeatedly saying that North Korea is collapsing down very soon, but it never happened. And actually, we have no signs of impending uh, collapse of North Korea. But actually, uh, that was actually ending uh, the negotiation at the moment of like uh, between 1991 and 1993. And the problem didn't go away. Uh, North Korea was actually, uh, I mean, I mean uh, strengthening its nuclear price, uh, nuclear program. In 1994, we have Geneva, uh, Geneva Agreement. Actually, uh, one of the consequences was uh, deployment of uh, Patriot missile system in South Korea. Uh, sounds fam very familiar because at this moment, it is not just Patriot missile system, it is THAAD, uh, which is very controversial issue regarding the relation between South Korea, China, and the United States. Um, in the middle of crisis, uh, President, uh, former President Carter visited North Korea and confirmed that nobody actually won another uh, Korean War in the peninsula. So, so they started the Geneva Agreement. What was the, con what was the term of Geneva Agreement? Uh, it was actually basically exchanging, uh, freezing North Korean nuclear program and actually uh, providing heavy, uh, uh, heavy oil uh, to North Korea and promising, U.S. promised to build light water reactor uh, and also eventually moving into diplomatic normalization and peace treaty. If you look at any kinds of negotiation with North Korea, they are actually talking about basically the same thing over and over. Like they actually made uh, talk about the same goal, exchanging nuclear program with uh, like diplomatic normalization and peace treaty. The problem is actually, again, not the problem of diplomacy itself, the failure of bringing dip diplomacy into higher level to achieve that goal. One of the important domestic political changes, uh, changes in the United States was uh, actually uh, uh, midterm election 1998, about like 17 days uh, after Geneva Agreement. Uh, contract with America, Newt Gingrich, actually uh, Congress was under uh, con conservative control and Republican control, and they actually um, 
uh, worked very hard to uh, actually um, obstruct uh, President Clinton's policy to implement uh, Geneva Agreement. So they actually believe uh, it was the a mistake in the first place to have negotiation with North Korea, again, the country that is going to be collapsing down very soon. So they actually were giving hard time f uh, for uh, President Clinton to implement uh, the negotiation. So there was actually stalemate, and North Korea was losing their patience. In 1998, they were testing um, testing uh, uh, missile, and interestingly, uh, there was another uh, diplomatic, I mean, domestic political changes in South Korea, and Kim Dae-jung and um, Clinton had much better chemistry, and they started some, uh, some uh, diplomatic eff efforts, such as Perry process, and uh, South Korea also started their own efforts uh, for inter-Korean uh, uh, negotiation, and um, uh, actually Kim, uh, Kim Dae-jung, President Kim Dae-jung won the Nobel Peace Prize um, for uh, such effort. So interestingly, uh, uh, North Korea was reacting to engagement. So you can find some pattern of prov uh, provocations and brinkmanship, of course, which, uh, which is like um, signature policy of North Korea, but actually you can find North Korea reacting diplomacy with the diplomacy. So it is more of the tit for tat policy if you are looking at long term perspective. And um, uh, this is me visiting North Korea, a uh, Kaesong industrial complex. One of the important um, uh, success of inter-Korean negotiation was actually establishment of Kaesong industrial complex. Did you know that actually one third of the population in Kaesong were working for South Korean companies, more than 100 uh, South Korean companies, and at a certain moment, 90% of uh, South Korean underwear were, were actually produced in uh, North Korea. So it was heavy, uh, 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 like very intensified e economic cooperation. Who was the leader of North Korea at that moment? It was Kim Jong-il, the father of Kim Jong-un. So Again, he was engaged, uh, he was reacting diplomacy with diplomacy. Um, but again, uh, uh, another do dip, uh, domestic political changes um, in the United States. President uh, uh, Bush came in and he was actually seeking some new policy to North Korea, which is ABC policy. What is ABC policy? Anything but Clinton. So actually there was very good momentum at the end of Clinton's regime. This is actually Vice Marshal uh, from North Korea, Cho myung Lok. He was visiting uh, Washington, D.C., and there was some very positive uh, like, uh, momentum between the United States and North Korea. And Albright, uh, Secretary of State, was actually visiting North Korea. There was very good momentum to end uh, missile uh, issues and move into denuclearization. But uh, again, uh, President Bush was very, uh, not very interested in continuing the momentum. And, uh, of course, we have uh, uh, 2002 nuclear crisis, second nuclear crisis. Of course, we have some, uh, somebody who can talk about technological issues, but the end of uh, Geneva Agreement. At least, uh, Geneva Agreement was successful in freezing North Korean nuclear weapons uh, between 1994 to 19, uh, 2002. Uh, North Korea could have produced much more nuclear material if it were not for Geneva Agreement. So the question is, um, the HEU, I mean, I don't have a time to talk about that, but uh, HEU, like, is that worthy to end Geneva Agreement, uh, like, in the name of a, a highly enriched uranium? Still, it is controversial whether it is more than laboratory level status. Uh, so, again, it was rather uh, or or nothing kinds of approach to North Korea. If you are not achieving um, the full denuclearization, we will actually dismantle Geneva Agreement. But it was actually giving some opportunity for North Korea to reprocess their uh, nuclear program. And actually, at least 2006 nuclear test was actually the consequence of uh, the de unfreezing of uh, Geneva Agreement. Um, another momentum was coming uh, like with uh, domestic political changes in the United States. Uh, first, um, 2005 and two, uh, 2005, they actually started, uh, like between 2003 and 2005, they started a uh, negotiation between uh, United States and North Korea in the name of six party talk uh, with the support of uh, South Korea and China. At the same time, uh, North Korea finally tested nuclear weapon in 2006 after BDA issue. And uh, there was domestic political changes in the United States with the landslide uh, victory of Democratic Party um, in um, uh, midterm election. and. Some of the neoconservatives were kicked out of the administration. So Bush administration actually tried some diplomacy, and one of uh, like under uh, Condoleezza Rice as a Secretary of State, 
and Christ Hill, Christopher Hill. And there was actually some consequence of moving that forward, uh, moving the negotiation forward. North Korea actually uh, exploded their cooling tower and broadcasted uh, that into CNN. So there was some uh, achievement. The, f the problem is actually the, the, the discontinuity and failure to bring that further into higher level. Um, there is another factor, like Bush was named the president and South Korean president, uh, the new president, uh, Lee myung Bak was more conservative, and North Korea had, a, uh, had its own domestic uh, political issues of Kim, uh, Kim Jong-il had a stroke, and North Korea moved into much more um, succession process. So Obama, why didn't we have uh, some meaningful success under Obama? Uh, uh, unfortunately, no, Obama tried, uh, like, contrary to the general belief that Obama was seeking only strategic patience policy, but that actually there was some negotiation tried by United States. And North Korea at that moment was much more into domestic politics. Kim Jong-un was much more into uh, strengthening its own uh, regime and purging his uh, competitors or something like that. So, um, yep. So, um, so finally, we, uh, I'm, going to talk, I'm going to finish with some um, interesting story, um, like uh, Lion and the uh, uh, Farmer's Daughter. Um, the, uh, interestingly, uh, it is the story of Aesop, uh, and Lion fell in love with Farmer's Daughter, and he was, ask, I mean, he was asking the farmer to get married to his daughter, and the farmer was saying that, uh, my daughter is afraid of your claws and teeth. If you pull them out, I'm going to allow you to get married to my daughter. And he did that because he was so in love, and actually uh, there's no reason for a uh, farmer to be afraid of the lion, right? So actually he beat him to death, and there's no uh, happy ending for lion. So the problem is North, actually without addressing the root causes uh, of North Korean fear, uh, bad guys can feel threatened. North Korean fear of the war and uh, the confrontation is uh, real, and without uh, addressing the root causes uh, of uh, confrontation and like the Korean War, which was never ended with peace treaty, uh, it will be very difficult to solve the problem. So I'm going to stop here and uh, continue with the Q&A. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the uh, International Institute and the NAM Center for having me and, and Dr. Bung for putting this all together. Uh, I wanted to start off with uh, a fact, but a very bizarre fact before I go into my presentation, which is going to be very depressing. Uh, it was uh, recently announced that Dennis Rodman has uh, volunteered his services to mediate this problem. Uh, and uh, as strange as it is, he's the only person in the world who has a pre-existing relationship with Kim Jong-un from multiple visits there and a pre-existing relationship with President Trump from being on Celebrity Apprentice. <laughs> so if you think of it, this is how serious the North Korean nuclear issue is, but at the same time how farcical the North Korean nuclear is issue is. And that has been a perennial challenge for me because I've been looking at the North Korea issue for decades now. And before really January of this year, when North Korea conducted its two nuclear ICBM I, I apologize, the intercontinental ballistic missile test, the ICBM test, the first on July 4th and the second on July 28th, North Korea was seen as a problem over there. So we're seeing North Korea elevated as a priority in Washington in a very short period of time. In the recent elite polling done among uh, decision makers, foreign policy leaders in Washington, North Korea polls at about 57% in terms of a priority. Uh, to give you a relative sense, ISIL and terrorism is about 28, 29%. So in a very, again, a very short period of time, North Korea has become the number one uh, threat to the United States. I wanted to frame my discussions uh, along the lines conceptually of North Korea Incorporated, and specifically looking through that lens of how the North Korean regime has accumulated learning and evading sanctions. It may seem esoteric, it may seem very specific, but it's actually one of the rare areas where you can do evidence-based research on North Korea. Because as it turns out, the North Korean regime is late to globalization and late to doing business in terms of procurement in a global marketplace, uh, but boy, have they caught up. They've caught up and they're doing their activities with a level of sophistication that is really startling. So with this, I, I wanted to uh, uh, bucket my comments in three areas, three questions. The first is, what is North Korea Incorporated? So I'll look at the origins, uh, origins and development of that area. Then the second, 
uh, how the uh, North Korean regime has actually been evading sanctions. So we'll be looking at the business practices that they've been adopting. And then the third, you know, this could be all very interesting, but the third, so what? What are the implications of all these? Uh, first off, North Korea Incorporated, if you think of it, the North Korean regime uh, has a very elite group of state trading companies, and they do business on behalf of the Kim regime. Uh, this is a very specialized group. Uh, they essentially go and live in the commercial hubs in China and Southeast Asia, and by living in these areas for years on end, they're developing business experience, and they're able to procure in ways that truly are startling. Uh, the discovery isn't that North Korea is doing procurement, it's that the way that they've been doing it now and the latest developments, uh, I would say, are a game changer. One of the things that we first have to do is depart from looking at North Korea as a country. When you look at it from this political economy lens, it's a phenomenon of the 1% and the 99%. So my comments are going to be focused on the 1%. They're the ones who are mobile. They're the ones who are doing the business. In the early days, the activities of North Korea Incorporated to sell items that would eventually help uh, generate operating budget. In, in briefings to different groups in Washington, uh, as I've mentioned to uh, you know, colleagues in the Pentagon, it's as if the Pentagon were running coal mines in West Virginia, selling that coal, and with that, bringing that as operating budget for the Pentagon. It's that level of very elite type of businesses. And over the years, this type of practice has uh, moved on to very specialized procurement. When you look at the China-North Korea relationship, uh, in this lens, through this idea of the business partnerships and the business activities, it is very much grounded in the Communist Party of China and the Workers' Party of Korea. Uh, North Korea incorporated uh, this phenomenon of these state trading companies doing this business for the regime, uh, has migrated into the Chinese marketplace, not by accident, but by invitation. So if you think of October 2009, this was a very important time period. Uh, then Premier Wen Jiabao led a delegation to Pyongyang, and it was a who's who in his delegation. Uh, the then Commerce Minister, uh, the Chairman of the Development and Reform Commission, uh, the very architects of Chinese economic development. They signed agreements under the headings of economic development, tourism, and education. Uh, China has been a lead author in a number of UN Security Council resolutions. And within that, there's always a clause saying member states are not prohibited from engaging in humanitarian and economic activity with North Korea. So for the Chinese to codify one of their agreements, economic development, uh, it's something of a legal loophole. Uh, the audiences in China, the message was very clear. Under Chinese law, it is legal to do business with North Korean entities. So from October of 2009, we see a dramatic uptick in these type of commercial activities happening between these elite state trading companies and uh, Chinese uh, private companies on the other side. If you look at the reports of North Korean workers in China, uh, they're usually in China, most of the occasions, on learning permits, which is an educational program. And when you look at Chinese nationals going into North Korea, they're going on tourist visas, which allow them to essentially go back and forth with uh, a great deal of ease. So you're looking at the very conduits. These, these are three gateway agreements that opens up the Chinese marketplace to North Korea Incorporated and facilitates this type of trade. It's not to say all of this trade is illegal. Uh, if you look at it, the vast majority of it is benign goods going back and forth. But if you think of a commercial channel, once you build one of these things, you can easily move illicit goods as well. And so this is where we're seeing, uh, I think, uh, the actual mechanism in which uh, a lot of these banned items are getting into the North Korean side. So moving to the actual parts of uh, how North Korea regime has been able to evade sanctions, I uh, wanted to frame them under three headings. These are the business practices, the business partners, and the pathways. And when you look at it through that lens, you're seeing a type of activity that is really normal. That's the shocking finding, is the normalcy of their business practices. If you remove North Korea and you put an American or Australian or Canadian, that's how you do business in the Chinese marketplace. You partner up with a local Chinese partner. That individual helps you in terms of doing the facilitation of business. Uh, the different modification here is that the private Chinese company procures items, sometimes dual use industrial equipment, other times outright banned equipment, uh, as again, a smaller percentage of the larger benign type of uh, commerce that they do uh, to the benefit of the North Korean regime. So when you look at this type of activity, uh, one of the things that comes out also is the impact of sanctions. In the traditional literature on sanctions, if you apply sanctions on a target, you're elevating risk, and usually business partners are scared away from that. And eventually the target is not able to do their types of activities, and the hope is that they will change their behavior. In this case, we're trying to get North Korea to stop with their nuclear proliferation and come back to denuclearization talks. But in the marketplace in China, as it's configured between Chinese private companies and North Korean state trading companies, elevated risk is now attracting more capable private Chinese companies who 
we're demanding higher commission fees to compensate for that risk. So essentially what we're seeing is a monetization of risk. And with that, there's more of an efficient market going on in terms of this type of business dealing. With this other element, in, in terms of switching to uh, the third part here, the so what of all of this, uh, I think when you uh, drill into this, there are two elements about the so what. Number one is that there continues to be an overestimation uh, on the sanctions that are geared towards stopping the North Korean regime from being able to procure these items that would go into the nuclear weapons or ballistic missile programs. Now, first off, the caveat is that there are many different types of sanctions. Usually it's just used as a across-the-board reference, but in the instance for this research, we looked very specifically at sanctions that were targeted against uh, proliferation items. But when you look at this overestimation, we're also seeing the overuse. And if you think of sanctions in this particular instance as antibiotics, by using sanctions more and more on the North Korean regime for this specific purpose, we're actually seeing the North Korean regime start to exhibit superbug traits. It's actually getting the resistance to these uh, measures. But unfortunately for us, this is counterintuitive and counterproductive, clearly, but we're also seeing the North Korean regime innovate in terms of their business practices. Uh, and it's also creating the space for more capable private Chinese companies to come out of the woodwork. The broader so what to all this is in terms of the U.S. strategy in dealing with North Korea right now. It is called maximum pressure and engagement. And if you look at it, it is an effort to move from diplomatic efforts to engage North Korea to come off the ledge and come back to denuclearization talks. That hasn't worked, so there is more focus now on sanctions. But the view in terms of this process elimination is if sanctions don't work, and there is a certain time uh, amount allotted to that, we're looking at the use of force. The caveat here is that we're not looking at an outright first strike on the North Korean regime, but rather the, rather the greater buildup of military pressure on North Korea. Uh, these are areas that we're concerned in terms of inadvertent escalation because we're going to see uh, the greater deployment of U.S. military capabilities to the region, even more so than now. So let me conclude with a saying in the U.S. Army that between the terrain and the map, the terrain always wins. One of the things about this type of sanctions research is that there's still a lot of focus in terms of the security aspect as well of very well-known case studies within the North Korea and related fields. Those are absolutely correct in many cases. But what's different is the terrain has changed so much. And I, I would uh, encourage the group to, again, think of this idea of North Korea Incorporated and how it's migrated into the Chinese marketplace. Uh, the facilitators of this, it's not a massive flow of North Korean officials and business uh, people going into the Chinese marketplace. Rather, it, it's Ch North Korean diplomats who are using their diplomatic privileges to stay in China and these commercial hubs for years on end to learn the business. But it's rather these business partnerships with local Chinese partners that has leveled uh, the playing field in terms of North Korea being able to do this procurement and do this type of activity in a way that right now, uh, the rapid pace of North Korea's development is still continuing to take us by surprise. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I wanted to focus on North Korea and the United Nations and more broadly, um, what might the North Korea example illustrate about, or tell us, um, about the continued role of the United Nations, especially in a world where the U.S. president um, has demonstrated significant skepticism, shall we say, about multilateralism and multilateral institutions. Um, by way of background, um, I wanted to say at the outset, I've been using the North Korean sanctions regime to introduce the powers of the Security Council from the first time that I taught a class about international organizations at the law school back in 2010. Um, I used it because the Security Council sanctions on North Korea were a nice example of what typical Security Council sanctions looked like. Um, and I knew the North Korea sanctions regime pretty well because I had worked on it at the State Department um, where I had worked uh, before joining the law school faculty. But I will say, as I sat down to revise the syllabus before teaching the class in the winter of 2016, I thought, gosh, maybe it's really time to update my syllabus. The sanctions regime is now a decade old. Uh, 
it's kind of out of date. But of course, um, very shortly before the semester began, North Korea claimed its first test of a hydrogen bomb. Um, and I didn't revise my syllabus, at least for that day. Um, subsequent developments mean that my example that I feared was out of date um, is giving my class a ripped from the headlines topic. Um, so, uh, right, so what I want to do is look at North Korea as an example um, to illustrate both the powers and the limits of the Security Council in managing threats to international peace and security. Um, and as I said, uh, also to provide some insights on the future of the UN given the current skepticism of uh, the US president to multilateral institutions. So uh, the primary goal for which the United Nations was established is the maintenance of international peace and security. And it does so in two ways. So first, it codifies some of the most important rules about when the use of force is permissible. Um, and second, it creates an institution, the Security Council, um, with the authority to respond to specific threats to international peace and security. Now, as a legal matter, compared with other international organizations, the Security Council is quite um, remarkable because of the dramatic nature of its authorities. So uh, when the Security Council determines there's a threat to international peace and security, um, there are at least two categories of things that it can do. It can authorize the use of force, and it can also require all UN member states to take whatever measures it deems appropriate that don't involve the use of force. Um, this latter authority is codified in Article 41 of the UN Charter, and the Security Council has exercised this Article 41 authority on numerous occasions over the past decade, to respond to North Korea's nuclear test. Um, pursuant to this authority, among other things, the Security Council has created um, a partial economic embargo on specified categories of goods. It's established a maritime inspection regime and created a targeted sanctions regime that freezes the assets of designated individuals and organizations. Um, to the extent that there are limits on the effectiveness of sanctions, that sanctions are something of a cat and mouse games, it's important to note that the Article 41 authorities are limited only by the creativity of the Security Council. So the legal authority to um, ramp up sanctions and to turn to different kinds of sanctions is something that is, uh, that is an, op an opportunity that remains open to the Security Council. So the way this works is a legal matter. When the Security Council takes decisions under Article 41, um, it creates new binding legal obligations on all UN member states to implement those sanctions. And it's very rare among international institutions to empower a subset of member states to make any decisions at all that affect the legal obligations of all member states. Here, under the UN Charter, the Security Council is empowered to make these decisions, and the kinds of uh, legal obligations that it can impose are quite significant. There's another feature of the UN um, Charter and the Security Council that's worth mentioning, and that is, of course, the particular subset of states that are members of the Security Council. It's not a random group of 15 states that can do this. Um, the UN Charter gives a very special status to the five permanent veto-wielding states of the Security Council. Um, and this special position that is accorded to the P5, the five permanent members, is, uh, according to some, the original sin of the UN Charter. Um, why is it the original sin? For a few reasons. Um, so according a small number of states, these, this special status arguably makes a mockery of the idea of sovereign equality that appears elsewhere in the charter. Um, it 
paralyzes the Security Council from acting whenever there's a disagreement among the P5. And of course, one of the most salient examples today of such inaction is Syria. Uh, according the P5, the special status also saps the organization of legitimacy by entrenching the power of five states that happened to come out at the top of the heap 70 years ago in the wake of World War II. Um, so I'll come back to this, but for the moment, the point is if North Korea showcases the power of the Security Council, it also illustrates the Security Council's limitations. So though, although the Security Council has adopted a series of sanctions that have been ratcheted up over the past decade, it has not, at least not yet, been enough to halt North Korea's nuclear program. Um, and of course, notwithstanding how extensive the Security Council's legal authorities are, they still depend on reaching agreement among the P5, and both China and Russia have been reluctant to go along with some of the more stringent sanctions that have been proposed over the past decade. Um, so what can North Korea demonstrate about the relationship between the United States and the United Nations during an administration that is skeptical about the benefits of multilateralism? Um, I think two things, right? So when President Trump uh, last December as president-elect tweeted, these days one can't go to a foreign policy lecture without hearing about Twitter, um, he tweeted uh, that the UN was, quote, just a club for people to get together, talk, and have a good time. Um, sad, exclamation mark. He seriously underestimated what the Security Council can do, at least in those situations where there's agreement among the P5 to do it. The other thing is that North Korea is one more reminder of what a good deal the UN is for the United States as a permanent, permanent veto-wielding member of the Security Council. So this takes me back to the, the original sin point. Perhaps the best defense of the special authorities that the UN Charter grants the P5 goes back to the moment of the UN's founding. At the time that the UN Charter was being negotiated, the failure of the League of Nations was still very salient in the minds of those who were, um, who were negotiating in San Francisco. The failure of the League of Nations was due, at least in part, to the United States' decision not to join the League. And so the special status accorded to the P5 helped to ensure that the United States and other key powers in the wake of World War II participated in the organization instead of standing on the, side, on the sidelines. And I would argue that the special status for the P5 is continuing to do important work today in keeping, in particular, the United States in the organization and thereby contributing to its resilience. In the past year, the Trump administration has already demonstrated its willingness to walk away from a number of multilateral agreements and institutions. So President Trump withdrew the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership his first week in office. Just last month, the Trump administration announced that the United States would withdraw from UNESCO, the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. There's legislation that has been introduced in Congress, uh, H.R. 193, the American Sovereignty Restoration Act of 2017, that would withdraw the United States from the UN. Uh, so is there any real risk there? I don't think that there is. Um, and here, I think the experience of the George W. Bush administration may be instructive. Um, now, of course, President George W. Bush is not commonly remembered as a great friend or ally of the United Nations. In U.S.-U.N. relations, probably his two most memorable decisions were in 2003 invading Iraq without the backing of the Security Council, and in 2005 appointing John Bolton to be his ambassador to the U.N. Bolton, of course, was the one who said famously, or perhaps infamously, 
If the UN Secretariat building in New York lost 10 stories, it would not make a bit of difference. But if you take a closer look at the Bush administration's record at the Security Council, it actually shows a high level of engagement and activism. Um, so a statistic that is perhaps surprising, by the time the Bush administration ended in 2008, the Security Council had adopted nearly 1,900 resolutions in its 60 plus year history. More than one quarter of these resolutions had been adopted during George W. Bush's presidency. Um, among these, of course, were the resolutions that established the sanctions regime on North Korea. The picture looks quite similar on peacekeeping. So it, it was George W. Bush who oversaw a massive expansion in UN peacekeeping. The number of deployed peacekeepers grew from 36,000 in 2003 to more than 93,000 in 2008. And so it's my, in my view, it's not crazy to think that the Trump administration will come around in a similar way and recognize in the same way that George W. Bush did that the Security Council is a quite powerful institution and also one that is by design extraordinarily favorable to the United States. So where does this leave us? Um, I think there's a good case to be made that the structural favoritism of the P5 in the UN Charter is indeed the UN's original sin and its greatest weakness, but I'd argue at the same time that it's one of the organization's greatest strengths. And in this era of uh, presidential, of at least US presidential hostility to multilateralism, the combination of the veto and the power of the Security Council will help, keep, will help to keep the United States inside the United Nations and will help the United Nations endure as an institution. All right, hi everyone, thanks for inviting me. This is a great panel and I'm happy to be here and represent a little bit of the technical side that we heard a lot about the policy, but I'll be covering a bit on the North Korean nuclear program as it uh, relates to the international community's efforts to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons around the world. So, background to the work that we do within the Consortium for Verification Technology, which is a consortium that we lead here at Michigan with 12 universities and nine national laboratories, involve um, coming up with new technologies and policies to help prevent the spread of nuclear weapons around the world. So since the discovery of fission in the late 1930s, the world has seen a fast growing expansion of nuclear capabilities and that happened you know during the Manhattan Project um, the bombs dropped on Japan um, and then following that the nuclear arms race between the United States and Russia so in the 50s and 60s uh, the world decided well this is completely out of control let's do something about it and what was done about it was the non-proliferation treaty so this was a treaty that basically divided the world into nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. And it was decided that the nuclear weapon states would keep that technology, the weapons technology, and the non-nuclear weapon states would not seek to build nuclear weapons capabilities. But they would still be allowed to use nuclear power. So this shows the duality of this technology that can be used for generating carbon-free electricity, but could also be used to develop powerful, deadly weapons. And so we see this conundrum here. So since the NPT, several other treaties have been developed to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons around the world. And um, I won't mention them all here, but I'll be talking a bit about the CTBT, which is a treaty that would ban all nuclear explosions for any reason. 
and this treaty is still under ratification. It's been signed by a lot of countries, but it hasn't been ratified by, by enough countries, and so including you know, the, the US and China. So let's take a look at the history of nuclear weapons testing. So I mentioned uh, the initial nuclear tests in 1945. And what you see in this graph is on the x-axis is time, the years, and then on the y-axis, the number of weapons tests. And if it's above this line, you know, it's an above ground test. And if it's below the line, it's underground test. So you can see that the initial developments were done with testing above ground. So you need testing in order to know that the design of your weapon is going to work, right? So that's why we have weapons, we had a weapons testing. So you can see, you know, in the first years and after the war, you know, this craziness, a lot of tests. These are all above ground tests, you know, the US, Russia, um, you know, imagine the fallout, you know. And then eventually it was determined, you know, let's go below the ground. And so these are underground tests. So what that means is if it's underground, you're containing the results of that nuclear explosion, the fission fragments and everything else, which is, of course, uh, very dangerous. So the below ground tests you can see here, and then eventually uh, a kind of moratorium. That's when the uh, threshold test ban treaty um, and the CTBT began we began talking about that and talking about stopping nuclear testing. Okay, so since then, no tests for several years and then a few blips, and those blips are, of course, North Korea. So North Korea has had six tests and they have all been underground. So how do we uh, detect these tests? How do we verify eventually the comprehensive test ban treaty? There are different technologies that we use and we have a network around the world and in this map you can see the actual location of these detectors that are aimed at detecting any nuclear explosion. And these detectors include uh, seismic, radionuclide, infrasound, and hydroacoustic detectors. And I'll be focusing today on the seismic and radionuclide detectors. So we have lots of stations around the world. So this graph shows uh, the timeline of the six nuclear tests in North Korea. And so the first one in 2006 that was mentioned earlier uh, had an estimated yield of less than one kiloton. So for a nuclear weapon, that would be considered a fizzle, meaning that the design did not quite get all of the explosive capability out of the fissile material. And so here, I, I just want to mention the two basic types of weapons are based on uranium or plutonium. And we can get to those two types of weapons by different ways. So uranium is present in nature, but it's not present in concentrations of U-235 that are high enough to build a weapon. So what we have to do is we mine the uranium from the ground, and then we enrich it by various methods into the uranium-235, which is the isotope that's useful for weapons. The other way is the plutonium bomb. And plutonium is not found in nature, so we have to make the plutonium in a nuclear reactor. And after we've irradiated the uranium, we take out the fuel, and we have to do a complex chemical processing to extract out the plutonium in, in, in enough quantity to make a weapon. So these are the two main pathways to make nuclear weapons. So, okay, so the first one was a fizzle, meaning it didn't quite work. So now the North Koreans are learning, right? They're improving their technology, they're learning. And the, the next test was a lot better, five kilotons, and so on. You can see that, uh, you know, tw 12 kilotons, 11 kilotons. These are estimated yields, of course. And then uh, in 2016 was about 20 kilotons. So for comparison, the, drop, the bombs that were dropped in Japan at the end of the Second World War were order of magnitude 15 kilotons. So this weapon here in 2016 was uh, approximately the same yield. Now the uh, explosion that happened this year in September was a lot larger. And 
the estimated yield for that uh, was anywhere between 50 and 250 kilotons. So that's a factor of about 20 larger than the previous uh, explosion. So we have seismic signatures that can help us say, you know, what was the yield of this weapon? And in this graph here on the right, you see uh, seism seismograms that were recorded all the way in Norway. So you can see um, the magnitude of these seismograms for the six tests. And you can see the increasing magnitude over the years. And the last row here shows the last test, very large. The map here shows the position of the test site and the various stations in China and elsewhere in Russia that um, pick up these signatures. So the second method, and this really tells us a fingerprint that this was a nuclear event versus some other type of explosion, like a chemical explosion, for example, is the detection of radio xenon. And so this is a fission product, and what you see here is um, a detector of the type that can measure the radio xenon uh, from the atmosphere. So if there's venting from one of these underground tests, that means some of the fission products make it out into the atmosphere and are then in very small concentrations can be detected by these detectors, even when they're placed thousands of miles away from the location of the explosion. So depending on where the wind blows and what the atmospheric conditions are, we may pick up these radio xenon uh, isotopes that really tell us for sure that this was a nuclear event. Okay, so in 2013, we saw both xenon-133 and xenon-131M. These are two isotopes of uh, xenon. On the graph here on the upper right, you see um, some sources of background and how it's important to get better detectors because there are some other facilities that could also produce some of these radio xenon. So these form some kind of background and these include reactors and medical research facilities. So to summarize and conclude, um, we've detected seismic signatures from each of the six nuclear tests that North Korea um, performed. Um, we've shown radio xenon detection from the 2013 test. Uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a radio xenon signature yet from this last test. This could mean simply that the test was well uh, underground and th so there wasn't venting uh, from that test yet. We still have challenges remaining in estimating the yield of these explosions. Um, as you saw, you know, the, the yield estimates varied widely for the last test between uh, 50 and 250 kilotons. And so that means that we need to know at what depth, you know, the explosion happened. Because depending on the depth, our seismic signa signature will vary quite a bit. So that's still uh, challenging and um, we're still working on that as well as minimizing the uh, amount of radio xenon uh, with more and more sensitive detectors that can detect very small amounts of radio xenon to be able to say for sure that that explosion was nuclear. So with that, I will finish and thank you very much for your attention. Great, so I think each panelist successfully raised many, many interesting questions. And so if you wanted to uh, submit your cue cards and had any questions, then I would be happy to take them and see um, which ones we can handle given our 15 minutes remaining for Q&A.
wondering if my criteria should be to challenge the speakers or <laughs> start with a relatively uh, benign question. Mm. So let me pose this one just because China had been um, featured in several of the speakers' talks. So we have a question that asks, is China using North Korea as a foreign policy threat against countries in the region? And I'll open that up to any of the speakers. Um, no, I don't think they're using uh, North Korea as a threat against others. Uh, but they are, as I say, um, not preventing North Korean proliferation because they're concerned about its stability. And therefore, um, um, sanctions don't matter because they're not going to be successful. And verification doesn't matter because um, once uh, because they're not going to agree to non-proliferation. Um, uh, and uh, measurement doesn't matter because once they have an H-bomb reliably uh, seen, it doesn't matter much what the yield is. And negotiations don't matter because there's nothing that they have to negotiate that is worth giving up nukes. And if they don't do that, then there's nothing we have to negotiate. I think um, China is not threatening uh, the region with that, uh, North Korean uh, issue, but uh, it is definitely China has been using North Korean issue as some uh, diplomatic leverage. Uh, like anybody else, they are seeking their own national interest. Interestingly, overall, I think like China has been very relatively responsible uh, in hosting some of the important multilateral talks, like uh, six-party talks. So China has been relatively facili uh, has been working as a facilitator in the negotiation. At the same time. If uh, there's any kind of, from my perspective, if there's any kind of reasonable uh, alternative at this moment to solve the problem, China actually pro uh, I mean proposed some um, options such as like the strategy of uh, double freeze and simultaneous progress. So at this moment, it is pretty unrealistic asking North Korea to denuclearize uh, first. So we can actually set the bar, bar relatively low and actually uh, start with uh, some freezing of North Korean uh, further nuclear tests or missile tests and U.S. Uh, military exercises as a first stage uh, of negotiation. And if it is successful and they achieve some level of trust, they can move on to the next stage of sim simultaneously seeking um, peace treaty uh, between the two countries at the same time exchanging it with uh, denuclearization process of North Korea. So I think it is very reasonable and probably the only alternative. The question is actually, how can you achieve such a simultaneous step-by-step -step, uh, process? Do you have political, ca uh, political will and ca uh, political capital to achieve such a long-term diplomatic goals? That is the question. So uh, I, I would uh, add to that, uh, there is one aspect of looking at the institution building between the two parties. So the Communist Party of China, uh, I think, has been trying to rebuild the Workers' Party of Korea. And that's an institution to institution play. Uh, and in terms of looking at the patterns, uh, one, aspects of, um, one aspect of inviting North Korea Incorporated, which is an extension of the Workers' Party of Korea, to embed in the Chinese marketplace. Uh, and I would agree with uh, Professor Axelrod in terms of the stability aspect. That is an institutional play. It's going to take time, but that is, I think, the uh, hope in terms of building that institution. So one day, the Ch Communist Party of China is dealing with Korea Workers' Party officials who have no linkage to the Kim family. Uh, if you look at uh, one of the legacy issues that uh, is only going to grow in, in time, those individuals who reside in the Chinese marketplace, who are the party elites from the North Korean side, uh, they're very much from the Chinese lens, the future. So the idea is, how do you scale them up? How do you, how do you have many more of these type of uh, North Korean Workers' Party officials. And, and I think that's the element that right now, you know, s the, the security concerns are very real and they are growing, but uh, seen almost as uh, a risk factor that the Chinese leadership is trying to deal with and weather this storm as opposed to do something that would be viewed from a Chinese calculus to be rash. Okay, so there's a, we have a technical question that I think um, some of the panelists could address, which is, do China and Russia cooperate in sharing monitoring data of nuclear tests? 
Well, the short answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to elaborate at all on? So um, <clears throat> we have um, seismic data from Chinese stations that are close to the North Korean test site that we have access to and that we've been able to analyze. And uh, the analysis basically consists of looking at the P and S waves in the seismograms and looking at the ratio of these waves. And when we do that, we can discriminate a nuclear weapons test from an earthquake, say. And that's very important, obviously, for monitoring for nuclear activities. Okay. So it seems we have a lot of questions regarding China. So I'm just going to, I'm going to actually combine two questions into one and ask, to either, for the speakers to either talk about what reaction China would have if Japan, South Korea, and or Taiwan were to have nuclear weapons, or to address the question of, um, so a credible military threat to North Korea would require us, I'm assuming the US, to concentrate forces in South Korea and West Pacific. Even if this would have potential value as a threat, would China tolerate our US doing it? So either of the two, which I think both gets to this China card. Um, the United States already has a credible conventional threat against North Korea. And there's no gain, partic particularly in adding more troops, uh, uh, bringing more weapons um, to the area. Um, the missile defense um, is a potential um, um, improvement in defense capabilities, but as I say, I don't think it's ever going to be sufficient to um, uh, reliably uh, protect targets from uh, the fear of a few at nuclear weapons, and a fear of a few is enough um, to deter. Um, on uh, if China, if Japan and South Korea get nuclear weapons, China will certainly uh, resent and resist and do what they can to prevent. Um, there's still an amazing degree of um, hatred among the Chinese for the Japanese, um, and they will take it extremely badly, but I don't think there would be a lot that they could do about it. I think that would be a nightmare for China if the nuclear weapons are spreading into um, uh, South Korea and uh, Japan and eventually into Taiwan because uh, China has been considering Taiwan issue as a sovereignty, national sovereignty issue, and Taiwan acquiring nuclear weapon means China will have hard time achieving eventual unification between the two sides. So uh, China will never accept that kinds of things to happen. And you can ask the same, I mean, similar question, like what would uh, China do if Taiwan declare independence? China has been very clear that they're going to use military against that. Uh, uh, and the same question, the mirror image of China-Taiwan uh, issue is actually China-US North Korea issue. Like, what would uh, China do if the United States starts a military intervention against North Korea? China will definitely intervene into the situation from my perspective. So that is another factor. Uh, the military option is actually very dangerous and it might plunge everybody in East Asia uh, into like regional warfare. So. Uh, just briefly uh, add to the second question about how China might react to or, or tolerate military action against North Korea. So uh, China and North Korea have a 1961 mutual defense treaty, uh, which the Chinese acknowledge or tried to signal to North Korea no longer is operational on the mutual defense side. They like the mutual prosperity side. Uh, so coincidence correlation, over the years, the, the North Koreans have moved or are using more of their nuclear and ballistic missile testing facilities near the border with China. So if the U.S. were to conduct military operations to take those facilities out, you would automatically trigger the mobilization of the totality of the Chinese military. So from that angle, it's not really a decision. That, that's just a function of protecting your airspace, protecting your borders. Uh, and if that's a North Korean calculus to continue with this development, thinking that this is some kind of insurance card, uh, then we're, we're worried about uh, the type of escalation that, that may be very rapid uh, and, and happen on a scale that we really haven't seen before. 
Um, the, so the question itself highlights one of the reasons why the North Korea problem is not only a North Korea problem. Um, North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons threatens to make other countries that have renounced them through the non-proliferation treaty that Professor Posey described kind of feel like they're suckers, right? They're going to reevaluate their decision to renounce nuclear weapons in a world where not only North Korea, right, potentially other states as well start pursuing nuclear weapons. So the possible unra unraveling uh, is systemic. It's not merely regional. Okay, so we have a question that is a bit more North Korea specific. And I'm not sure if anyone wanted to jump in, but I'll put it out there. Um, we have a question of why should we assume that North Korea's end game is just survival, but not dominating South Korea? I think this might have been ways because there were some hints that of a very rational or even fearful North Korea with very uh, rational objectives for what it's doing. And so this might be an interesting question. They were actually making that miscalculation uh, at the moment of 1950. They were actually invading South Korea, believing that the United States will not intervene or they can unify the country before U.S. intervention. That was a big mistake. The United States committed uh, to South Korean uh, defense. And of course, we have very strong bilateral uh, like military alliance between the two countries. So uh, again, more than 30,000 mil U.S. military soldiers are stationed in uh, South Korea. So any kinds of attack against South Korea will automatically trigger U.S. intervention. It is like a trip wire. So North Korea understands that very well. If it is actually on the U.S. side, uh, if United States is not undermining its commitment to uh, uh, South Korea, probably North Korea understands th uh, that very well. Recently, President Trump was mentioning uh, using his uh, signature art of the deal kinds of pressure to South Korea and uh, Japan, saying if you are not doing your part, paying more in terms of defense, uh, we are going to make, I mean, he's almost like mentioning that U.S. commitment to the region is somehow con con conditional or something. I think there's some risk in that kind of message because North Korea might be miscalculating again, but at this moment, general, I mean, no, no pre U.S. president will not desert North, I mean, South Korea or Japan, and the deterrence is working, and uh, nuclear umbrella, umbrella is covering uh, North Korea and South Korea. So North Korea knows very well, I guess, uh, and uh, it, there's very unlikely North Korea to start another Korean war and trying to offshore South Korea. So the mantra in Washington uh, among senior national security leadership, uh, as it's reported, uh, is, is a very simple, clear logic, and that is Kim Jong-un is irrational, uh, he is undeterrable, and he's revisionist. And because of that, it's better to deal with the problem now than later. Uh, and so the question really talks about the revisionist part. It's not just a function of he does an atmospheric test, declares himself a nuclear weapon ICBM state, uh, it's that once a nuclear ICBM state, that's where other nightmares start to happen. North Korea starts to throw its weight around, starts to intimidate, starts to coerce its neighbors. And in this area, the events of 2010 uh, are a very strong concern. So in 2010, in March of 2010, the North Koreans sank a South Korean naval vessel, the Chunan. Then later that year, they had an artillery exchange uh, in an area called the Northern Limit Line. Uh, that was seen as uh, a prelude of potentially the future because North Korea, uh, lashed out that way and almost taunted South Korea by saying, who would dare retaliate against a nuclear weapon state? And at that time, North Korea was viewed as a regional nuclear weapons state. A and as I mentioned uh, earlier, July is, is a threshold mark uh, in terms of psychological uh, threshold in Washington because that's when North Korea tested these ICBMs. Uh, and this is where it is quite haunting how this kind of mantra is becoming a reality. You know, Kim Jong-un is irrational, He's undeterrable and he's revisionist. It, it's almost preordaining this idea we have to act. It, it's not a what other evidence, can we try this or that. It, it's, it's used as a, a statement of fact. Um, just want to add one thing. Uh, we were mentioning hydrogen bombs. Um, we don't have known information at this point that the bombs that were exploded were H bombs, although the magnitude of the latest test is suggestive of an H bomb. 
We don't know that North Korea has capability to put that bomb on an ICBM and to deliver it onto a target. Those are very different things. Starting a test underground with all the time necessary um, to set that up uh, and performing the test is one thing. Having a deployable nuclear weapon is a completely different thing. I just want to add that uh, those three premises you hear about in Washington are, are all wrong. Uh, North Korea is, is about as rational as anybody else. Um, I could go into detail on that, but um, the United States is really just quite unpredictable, for example, as you say. Mao and Stalin were sure we wouldn't defend South Korea, so how predictable are we? Um, and uh, Japan was sure we would uh, uh, not carry through to the end the response to an attack on Pearl Harbor, so how predictable were we? So th I think um, they're rational in their own way. Are they deterrable? Of course they're deterrable. They don't want to lose their regime, and we have the capacity to do that. Um, are they revisionist? Only to a minimum extent. They don't really expect to be able to take South Korea. Um, very briefly, um, there is something called a chicken game, and actually there is some benefit of acting like a crazy guy in a chicken game. Actually, North, North Korea, everybody knows that North, North Korea has a very, very big mouth, and uh, Berber. And both sides are really good at it this yeah, year. At this moment. So <laughs> actually, North Korea knows very well that uh, if you are perceived as a crazy guy in the block, actually the other side will be swerved and you will win the game. The problem is actually both sides have are using the, that kind of tactic. So is that going to work as a deterrence model or spiral model? Uh, it, it, it can be debatable, but you can ac actually interpret some actions of North Korea acting like crazy from realistic perspective. It might be some calculated action. Actually, there is Chonan and Yeonpyeong, uh, and North Korea, it was more of the border skirmishes, and North Korea never escalated that into the full-scale warfare in the Korean War. Okay, great. So on that sober note, I think we are out of time. So we'll give our panelists a big round of applause, and thank you for coming. Thank you.